Welcome everyone to the Council on um, Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Council on Middle East Studies Colloquium this year featuring Yale faculty talking about their books. Today I am absolutely thrilled to be in conversation with my colleague Evren Savci, whose book Queer in Translation Sexual Politics Under Neoliberal Islam will be hot off the Duke University Press this January. 2021. That is assuming that 2020 does actually come to an end. And that, of course, is precisely why Evren's work is so timely and so intellectually important. As a scholar of transnational sexualities, whose work is informed by feminist and queer theory, as well as ethnographic methodology, her scholarship thus far has very quickly become crucial to interdisciplinary analysis of the links between neo neoliberalism morality and otherness. In Queer in Translation, the subject of today's colloquium, Evren analyzes uh, how queer, gay, trans, and feminist communities translate sexual identity under Recep Tayyip Erdogan's AK AKP government. The book traces a stark shift under AKP's neoliberal Islamic regime from a politics of multicultural inclusion to securitize authoritarianism. <laughs> Evren draws uh, from ethnographic work with queer activist groups to understand how discourses of sexuality uh, uh, travel and are taken up in political discourse. As such, she intervenes in an epistemic double bind within queer studies, and this is where the book truly um, um, has an, a, a, an analytical impact where in, in queer studies where in universalizing neoliberal projects are posited as an assault to localized Islam identified political projects. Everin traces how this ge geopolitical domaining reifies such binaries as traditional, modern, authentic, colonial, global, local, and East-West. Ultimately, the book offers translation as a queer methodology to think Islam and neoliberalism together thereby opening up ways of understanding um, the social movements and political discourses that coalesce around sexual liberation in ways that do justice to the complexities of both what circulates under the signifier Islam and of sexual political movements in Muslim-majority countries. And towards the end of this colloquium, I hope we have some time to hear her plans for her second book project, which is tentatively entitled Failures of Modernization, Polygamy, Islamic Matrimony, and Cousin Marriages in the Turkish Republic. Before turning to questions that the audience can submit at absolutely any time through the Q&A feature of the webinar, I'll collect and read them on your behalf later, I invite Evren to walk us through some of the key interventions she makes in queer and translation, sexual politics, and her neoliberal Islam. Go ahead, Evren. Um, thank you so much, Edda, for hosting me. Um, thanks also to CMS for organizing um, the colloquium like this this year. It's really nice to hear about everybody's work, and it's really a pleasure to be in conversation with, with each other. And thank you so much for this lovely introduction. So um, I think that the um, key interventions um, the book makes are, one is in the neoliberal Islam page, right? Like how neoliberalism and Islam are treated as epistemically in deeply different ways in queer studies. Um, I call neoliberalism as an object of critique and Islam as an object of rescue of queer studies thus far. And Islam is kind of only positioned as the target of neoliberal orders, queer politics that have turned both homonormative and um, part of a homonational world order where Islam and Muslims are positioned as um, kind of people and geographies indicating deep-seated, allegedly deep-seated homophobia, etc. So queer studies then problematizes this positioning of Islam and Muslims as deeply homophobic, justifying, you know, wars on terror, kind of um, signing up queers onto these um, imperial wars. Um, and I want to think about like, and this kind of positions Muslims as always, um, and imagines them as always kind of minority, as victimized, as immigrants, 
And that's not surprising because a lot of this work um, comes out of North America and Western Europe. That's, but um, I want to think about um, Islam and Yolivism together because they are lived together um, as a kind of a political, economic, religious regime in Turkey under which critical um, queer and feminist sexual politics have to unfold. So, so one inter I mean, the big intervention that I try to make is kind of to expose the um, epistemic divide in discussions of neoliberalism and discussions of Islam. And I also talk about how Islam is rendered like cultural, but with a capital C. Obviously anthropologists for decades now have invited us to think about culture as like historical, like deeply complicated, but this is, there's a reification of Islam and it gets made into a sign pretty much and it doesn't become like a lived reality. So I also try to bring that in um, and show the kind of what I call the messiness of the social um, in like on the ground. And translation is another um, addition or another contribution I hope to make to the field, which I was thinking as I was like kind of looking over my notes right before and I thought for the first time sort of I guess translation studies is to language what what ant contemporary critical anthropology is to culture so it's a field that really takes and shows how language with a capital L is a historical construct and like um, meaning is much messier than that. So, so then I take translation as what I call the queer methodology to think about the travel of terms such as gender identity, sexual politics, um, or LGBT politics, um, sexual orientation, hate crimes, outness. I trace the travel of these terms to the Turkish context and look at the social disjunctures they create as they enter debates and inform the ways in which people think about and talk about sexual politics. Thank you, Evren. Um, the book also puts forward uh, this frame, the framework of the politics of cruelty as um, potentially an alternative framework to universalizing liberal human rights discourses. Um, could you speak a little bit to how different activist groups that you did ethnographic research with engaged both, or differentially, to mm -hmm. quote you, had access to the discourse of liberalism, but also how this politics of cruelty can open different venues for, uh, for moving forward? Mm, thank you. Um, so since, um, I imagine kind of nobody read the book because it's not out yet. I'll just summarize very quickly besides Edda. So I'll say very quickly. So politics of cruelty is a concept I think about in um, chapter one of the book where I trace the travel um, and sort of discussions of LGBT rights um, along with some demands by LGBT activists to put in sexual identity, uh, se sorry, sexual orientation and gender identity into the um, what then was being drafted as the new constitution's kind of um, protection clause. Uh, and I look at how at the same time as headscarf activists were making demands for the right to wear the headscarf to public universities and public offices as employees, um, they were being kind of questioned by some um, that I refer to as kind of more storm secularists, suspicious storm secularists, as they were asking for the right to headscarf, they were being asked, well, if you want this democratic right, do you also support LGBT rights? And LGBT rights became the, literally the only one litmus test that these headscarf activists were being faced with. They were not saying, they were not naming other rights. They were not talking about ethnic rights necessarily. Um, and be that's because it was seen, I think, as the Achilles heel of um, Muslim women who might be demanding this democratic right to expose what was their presumed insincerity, right? They will just use their democratic rights to undermine other people's democratic rights. And I, um, I show that, first of all, there were various responses by various Muslim uh, women, headscarf activist subjects, like some of them state that they don't know much about this and they don't understand the equivalence that's being 
um, created between LGBT rights and headscarf rights, like so this is a very particular liberal equivalence, right? They they think these are very very different things, but some people. Um, there were discourses about homosexuality being an illness, homosexuality being a sin. And in all these debates, though, I point out that we are we can hear um, some headscarf activists saying, I cannot say that I support LGBT rights because being a uh, homosexual and homosexual was Asian side was the word that was used for like as an umbrella thing for all LGBT is, a, is haram according to Islam but I am against all cruelty against um, them. So I don't support police cruelty. I don't support state violence. So I try to think about what it might mean to think about a position against cruelty. And the meaning of cruelty was expanded. I think I probably only mentioned this in a footnote in the book, but later on, um, there's a very interesting kind of Muslim left group, they call themselves revolutionary Muslims, then they were like thinking of forced marriages of queer people as cruelty. So cruelty can also be things that are not necessarily legislated or legislatable so easily. Um, so I, I was inviting, I guess, the readers to think along with me about what it would mean if the emphasis was, and solidarity emphasis was put on not standing up for rights, that are very abstract anyway, but standing up against cruelty that is actually physically happening on the ground. And that could have been a big kind of um, coalition point or solidarity point for various groups, like headscarf activists have suffered police violence in the past, queer and trans people suffer police violence in the present, but, but those um, conversations were not had because the framework was the rights framework. Does this answer your question, Ada? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, as we wait for other questions, I'll take the opportunity to, to really uh, dig a little bit into um, how Islamic morality, both, I love this chapter because it shows on the ground how, uh, how the people themselves are negotiating, uh, but, but to give you the opportunity to also talk a little bit about how Islamic morality is used by state uh, related political projects to, to make this, um, or to, to achieve different different kinds of uh, translation, if you will, or different, different, uh, different kinds of travels of neoliberal and liberal um, discourses. Yes, thank you. Um, so some of the things that I talk about in the book about how the AKP government mobilizes Islam, and this is something I say kind of up front in, um, in the introduction, the, the goal of the book was never to trace the multiplicity of Islam, but it comes up everywhere in the field. It's impossible to avoid it. You don't have to set out to write about it. It is impossible to talk about one Islam with a capital A. People engage with it really differently. But the government seeks to monopolize the meanings of Islam, what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a, a good Muslim. And I talk about Islam as um, I follow scholars of neoliberalism who have emphasized the moral politics and the cultural politics of neoliberalism, the, the particular culture um, it, that, that it creates that divides people into deserving and undeserving um, subjects. And I talk about how Islam by the government, by the current government is used, is mobilized to um, inform those differentiations of deserving and undeserving. So um, we have really strange marriages where like the, there will be a talk the then prime minister but current president Ardan will give that is talking about the Turkish economy and the importance of it and the strength of it but there are enemies after it and it ties immediately into like why it's so important to have three children for all families because that's what's necessary for um for a strong economy and then he will go into, and it's also in the women's nature, in Islamic nature, in women's futrat, to become mothers anyway. Um, and don't worry about how to provide for children. Allah will provide their 
rizuk, their livelihood. So, so there are a lot of sort of um, seamless flows between what the economy necessitate, necessitates and what Islam necessitates and how they come according to the current government kind of perfectly together. I talk about, again, the use of kind of Allah given nature footsteps, um, to explain away um, workplace um, accidents, especially mine explosions and deaths of hundreds of miners, instead of talking about conditions of labor under neoliberalism and um, sort of deep unregulated privatization, it is explained by the God-given nature of mining, like obviously these things will happen. So there are um, various um, kind of ways in which Islam is used to domesticate neoliberalisms, morality, politics. Um, I, I think that's like helpful to explain. So thank you for asking that. Um, I think I was going to say one other thing about ah, so like in the in the chapter that we just talked about, I also trace the historical shifts that some actors involved in these um, debates also undergo themselves. Like they, some, some subjects also move from being very kind of seemingly um, liberal, uh, but with some critiques of liberalism, subjects demanding for the end to all cruelty and rights for everyone, like ethnic minorities and to, um, suing people because they insulted Turkishness, there are these kinds of codes in the Turkish um, criminal code, to becoming really like spokespeople for the government over time. But I think what I hope the chapter also shows is that liberal and illiberal ideas about justice go hand in hand all the time. So it's really difficult to say, here are some interesting, different, illiberal subjects who represent Islam, who look so radically different from how I, how we think in the West, quote unquote, about justice. Like I show that people who speak on behalf of like, you know, authentically Muslims need to understand homosexuality as a sin. Um, it's not an illness, that's a Western construct, are relying on a lot of post-structuralist theory to make a case for why this is also a tenable and inviting um, kind of argument for LGBT people themselves. Yeah, and the um, the book is very precise in terms of um, the contributions, especially to queer studies, and and I'd like to use some of these questions, both whether it's about uh, Islamic morality, but also, for example, the Kurdish question, mm -hmm. to think a little bit about where you see the book positioned in 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 reference to area studies uh, mm -hmm. scholarship. Um, and, and, and their approaches to whether it's sexuality or, or, or the Kurdish question or authoritarianism. Um, I love, for example, your, your framework of deep citizenship, which of course conjures up the deep state sort of analysis that comes from certain corners of, uh, of, our, um, of our little interdiscipline. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I um, picked queer studies as the sort of like main intellectual home in which I'm making a contribution, though I'm also trying to talk about queer studies in Turkey today a little bit and how um, their kind of disinterest so far in frameworks such as like homo nationalism or um, pinkwashing speaks to the relevance or lack thereof of these concepts when we're talking about a Muslim majority context. Um, I would say that, um, but I but I do then position the contribution also vis-a-vis -vis particularly Turkey. In the larger area studies, I mean, I have to say that some of the work that I have found the most useful within queer studies is coming from um, the kind of Middle East based or like mostly, yeah, like Paul Amar's work, Sima Shaksari's work. Um, the book was not yet out, but Saad Atsan's work, um, like I just read and reviewed the book over the summer, it's, it's fabulous. I would have cited it if it had been out by the time I had finished my book. So there is now, I think, an emerging queer Middle East studies, Ghassan Musawi's work, like so, um, Sarah Murad. So there are um, scholars, I would say, 
again, it, this is still not like the larger area studies framework, but there is a there is an area specific queer study scholarship that's also transnational that doesn't do this like um, here is a very specific case about Tunisia that has nothing to do with the rest of the world. I mean, I'm not saying that's what, you know, area studies does, but that's kind of like the stereotype, right? So there is a really deeply transnationalized area studies, queer studies um, mix that I think is becoming more and more prominent as people, as like kind of scholars are coming up and publishing more, which I think is going to make a shift in the way in which we talk about queerness and the Middle East, which was dominated for a long time by the Mossad framework and or the Poir framework. And I discussed that too a little bit in the book, but for a much deeper discussion of that, you should read Syed's book. Um, I mean, I know you have probably, but I'm like the, our audience, um, it's called um, Queer Palestine and the Empire of Critique. So, but yeah, so about, I mean, I, I wish that area, like area studies, especially Middle East studies, um, had more um, gender and sexuality scholarship um, overall, but I think that is forming as a field. It is like coming up. I think it's more junior. Um, there are fewer senior people working um, in, especially sec for sexuality studies. So, but I also do hope that some of the frameworks about the mobilization of Islam towards authoritarian ends or how particular neoliberal projects are being taken up in, um, in the Middle East. Like for instance, I talk about briefly um, how, like I don't, I try not, I, I mean, I, I aim at least at not exceptionalizing the AKP as like the inventor of neoliberal Islam. Neoliberalism and Islam have been brought together in the context of Turkey since 1980, for sure. And there are people who trace it even farther back um, because the US had particular liberal Islam projects all over the Middle East, especially during um, the Cold War and um, following the um, Islamic um, revolution in Iran. So there is a particular taming of Islam that's we need to think with that has transnational components. So I do hope that that is also kind of maybe making a contribution to um, thinking of area studies more transnationally. Um, yeah, and I think uh, we have a question from the audience that is a direct follow up to this, uh, an opportunity for you to tackle the homo-nationalism uh, discourse. So Sarah Omar, um, is wondering if you engage any of Joseph Massad's work, and I would add, uh, how do you respond to just just Poir, or how do you situate this book um, in relation to Poir, Massad, etc.? Um, okay, so I'll start with Massad. I, I talk about both of their work, and I talk about. Um, I'm going to try to keep this not too long because I feel like I can talk, but I, I want, I'm sure there'll be other questions too. Uh, and thank you, Sarah, for coming and for the question. Uh, so the, there are many ways in which their work influences mine. Um, one, um, and maybe the most initial one being, when I started research in the summer of 2008, um, their books had just come out the year before, and that was how everybody talked about and thought about LGBT activism. LGBT activism was not a cool topic at all. Like they were engaging in epistemic violence. They were the same everywhere in the world. I mean, I was told by, um, you know, mentors even that like LGBT activism, like it had the same, you know, it, it couldn't be seen at, like it wasn't seen as something interesting, exciting, promising, or um, different enough to study. And I think that they, now it's one thing to write a book, it's another thing for a book to become paradigmatic in a field. So you can't really hang that on someone's book. It, we should think about why certain books become so paradigmatic and others don't. Um, but I, so there was something about like their work that put a lot of suspicion on queer activism. And that wasn't what I was seeing in the field. And I know that a number of um, friends and colleagues who have studied queer activism, Ghassan Musawi is another one, like they, they it, but it does hang on you. It's something you have to grapple with, like even though what you're observing is quite different. Um, that's one thing. 
um, intellectually in the book, I respond to both of them differently. So um, Poir's work itself has changed a little bit over time. So like I, I do talk about the, I mean, I think that the like, common nationalism framework is really important and that book needed to be written and I, I teach it in my classes. I think my problem has been that it has become the paradigm through which we talk about Islam and queerness. And I wanted to break out of that paradigm. Masad's work also has become paradigmatic, and that is also something that I think we as scholars like also, you know, like participate in and per perpetuate. And the question of um, epistemic violence, like the LGBT activism itself being like nothing but, a, you know, um, wreaking epistemic haywalk in the Middle East or something or the rest of the world. And I, um, I deal with that in, um, basically arguing against the kinds of binaries this um, framework relies on, right? Like there is an authentic, untouched by modernity um, life that is being ruined by LGBT activism. Is, and, and in the conclusion of the book, especially, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. I hope people are following. Um, in the conclusion of the book, I talk about why neoliberalism and Islam have not been brought together in queer studies. And in that chapter, I more particularly talk about how this Foucault, assumed Foucaultian um, understanding of modernity in most of queer studies, also in Massad's work, that centers sexual subjectivity as the only marker of modernity has locked us into debates where all we can talk about is like, are gays and lesbians and trans people in Turkey, in my case, authentic or inauthentic, or are they redefining what it means to be gay or lesbian? And I want to be like, let's just not think about that. Let's think about other forms of modernity that are, I mean, why are we not alarmed about neoliberalism or, and I mean, okay, I'll, I'll qualify that, but neoliberalism or Turkey having a modern army or a modern tax, like it has all these other aspects of modernity. Why is the entire question of modernity hanging on like gay and lesbian identified people as they themselves are, by the way, fighting against neoliberal capitalism. So what do we make of, of this? Like, it doesn't really work with traditional modernity, colonial, authentic, indigenous kinds of divides. So these um, are kind of briefly the answers. I'm, it wasn't very brief, I know, but slightly briefly the answers I'm giving. I would like to follow up on that a little bit. And uh, how, for example, then do you, do you bring out that tension between, for example, on one hand, the discourse on homonationalism and these more recent interventions, whether it's the U or Sai, the Ashant, uh, queer Palestine, uh, in the case of, for example, the, the murder of the young Kurdish uh, man, Ahmed Yildiz, and um, how were discourses of terrorism and and LGBTQ uh, empowerment uh, deployed by the by the Turkish state in homonationalist mm -hmm. or not uh, uh, manners. Um, right. I feel like can we break down the question? Okay. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna respond to. Um, the my, my, well. Well, the, 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 simply, I wanted to think the homonationalism discourse is often uh, portrayed in West and East and to a more localized extent uh, when it comes to Israel, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the, Turkey, the Turkey Kurdish situation also replicates certain forms of this tension. Um, and I found the chapter on uh, Ahmed Yildiz. Um, I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing that no, name. You correctly, are. But, yeah, you are. Uh, uh, but uh, I found that chapter really fruitful to think with, uh, especially in terms of your in intervention of translation. That is not just liberal discourses that travel, it's also critiques. Um, and, and so maybe you, would, I, I don't know if you want to take this opportunity to talk about that, uh, that case, but I, I thought it had a lot of potential to to bring the homonationalist uh, uh, critique into an ethnographic um, understanding, right? 
Thank you. Yes. So um, in the chapter where I talk about the murder of Ahmed Yildiz, who was um, killed when he was 26 years old, he was a um, college student um, at the time of his murder. Um, I talk about, and he's a Kurdish um, gay man. And I, um, I do sort of various things in that chapter, which I, I know I understand your question better, some of which do um, can be understood through the framework of homonationalism, but some of which cannot. So like it exceeds kind of the framework of homonationalism, even though it doesn't completely say like it, it's not useful. Um, so in the story that I trace, like Ahmed is murdered, the Turkish papers report on this, um, and they also report on this um, woman who gets injured during the shooting. So, so Ahmed is murdered by being shot at in um, public while he's walking back to his car. Um, and um, the because the figure, the woman who was also injured is a well-known figure, well, somewhat better, much better known than Ahmed at the time, um, the Turkish papers focus on that. Then the Guardian writes, piece of news that's entitled um, was Ahmet Yildiz the victim of the first Turkish gay honor killing and then the gay honor killing framework takes over both in Turkey and abroad about how this news is talked about and Ahmet's Kurdishness disappears from the story his gayness becomes and his his potential murder by his family becomes the story so so that's is a very kind of and um turkish and turkish families or kurdish families i guess in this case too a little bit like the family as the locus of violence be, being this like sign of backwardsness and in these like backward geographies still families are so violent so there is a critique that can be made similar to critiques that already exist in queer studies that say, look, there is such a stark East-West divide, the independence narrative, which then is kind of translated into the Turkish narrative, keeps reproducing this East-West divide, um, Turkey versus Europe, or within Turkey, Western Turkey versus Eastern, more backwards Kurdish parts, according to um, people who are right, um, taking up this discourse. But then I show that, um, and there are other transnational kind of um, gay, um, male, more particularly bare subcultural kind of product, like video productions, other things to commemorate Ahmed that keep reproducing Islam as the culprit. Like it's like these backwards Islamic countries where, you know, like young gay people are killed by their families. In the meantime, though, like, so this is the homonationalist. Um, like I take people through what this analysis would look like if it the story ended there, if we stop the story there. But then there are all these other stories, as Edda was mentioning. Uh, first of all, the valorization and exceptionalization of the Kurdish gay life, the individual Kurdish gay life, and the ending of that, like eventful ending of that life, where Kurdish people are being murdered every day by the state in Turkey. And I talk about, so like, you know, Ahmed, we would have never heard of Ahmed's death or his name if he was. Um, killed in the more kind of mass operations of the government um, that were that that kind of in 2008 they were not really so there but they they picked up later as the story was kind of unfolding in the like coming years too so there's a question of like you know how how are we going to think about violence and death um, in the case of Ahmed um, and what it means to disappear his Kurdishness from the story um, in the context of Turkish government itself calling basically all Kurds and anyone who speaks on their behalf or wants like sort of peace terrorists and criminalizes them and securitizes them as terrorists. I also talk about the woman who ends up becoming the sole witness to the case who is um, an like an Islamic teacher, um, sort of private um, teacher and lecturer, and um, she understands the defense of Ahmed's life as part of her Islamic duty, basically. Um, so the story is actually very complicated, and I try to show that the framework of homonationalism only takes us so far. And then there are 
like quite messier realities on the ground that we need to deal with and we cannot absolve in my case the Turkish government and its positioning of Kurdish people as terrorists and the violence it um, deploys on them um, when we look look at the stories that we're telling. Thank you. Yeah, I found uh, the ending of that story to be very productive to think with. And this actually leads us very nicely to Zarina Grewal's question. Um, she She's wondering if you could elaborate on the point of agitating around the issue of the liberal Turkish families forcing marriage on queer adult children and its, um, uh, and its relationship to the transnational moral spectacles around immigration and forced marriage of young Turkish women. Have cases of forced marriage of queer adult children in diaspora become transnational moral spectacles in parallel ways? Mm, okay, I'm also looking at the question because it's like, um, well, but it's a great question. Thank you, Zarina. So, um, actually, um, the, so there is not that much colonization. And I think that, um, let, okay, I have a few things to say about this. So for one, I think that forced marriage should be talked about in the case of everyone, queer and straight and young and old and, you know, like, like as a structure. Um, the point I was making, I think I said it very pretty quickly, because it's not something I talk about too much in the book either. Um, it's um, actually not, um, not the positioning of like a, li a liberal Muslim um, parents marrying queer children. It's a Muslim group. They call themselves revolutionary Muslims. They used to be anti-capitalist Muslim youth. And then that's those two groups diverged basically. Um, and I write about revolutionary Muslims a little bit in the book. Um, they were the ones, um, uh, they're, they're very anti-capitalist left and they were the ones thinking, okay, we need to think about the issue of forced marriage as an issue of cruelty. And so that is like, um, they are also using the framework of cruelty, which is kind of neither liberal nor illiberal, I, I want to say, um, to think about like violence in more capacious way. Like what does it mean to enforce violence? Can we think about violence outside of the liberal juridical framework, like whatever the law recognizes? Um, like how do norms enact violence on people? Like so, they were. It was a it was a Muslim group, um, pious and self-identified Muslim group that was thinking about this qu question of forced marriages. Though I do think that again, this is a very productive space to think about these questions because there also are discourses of um, gay and gays and lesbians being forced into marriages, which I think parallel the discourses of um, gays being forced to undergo sex change operation in Iran when it's like basically the Iranian government subsidizes um, sex, you know, gender affirming surgery. So, so there is, there are a lot of um, transnational, you're right, like discourses about like Muslims forcing their children to do X, Y, Z. And we need to take that into consideration, but we sh I think that like on the ground conversations that are happening in Turkey um, happen for now at least liberated from those conversations and I find that to be very important. So I haven't really experienced people thinking too much like, wow, we don't want to air our dirty laundry, let's talk about this problem but we cannot have the world think that Muslims do these things actually but they do so what do we do so uh, and I find that really a liberating thing to be in a Muslim majority context to say this is our reality this is our life sure in Germany people might have the stereotype of, about Muslims we have these problems to tend to so but I think that those two stories need to be put together so as you're suggesting and maybe that kind of goes towards my also next project that wants to talk about these kinds of quote unquote failures of modernization where um, people are 
living in kind of structures that are like polygamy is seen as one of those structures where like people are forced into it and who would want it um it's horrible women are oppressed and stories are a lot more complicated than that obviously though there also are stories of violence and of oppression so i think that um Zarina's question is kind of helping me re-articulate um, this thing that I'm trying to keep, um, I mean, I did my best to keep alive in the book, which is the messiness of the social. It is, and, I, and that's something that I find very exciting. I think it's extremely difficult to represent it and do justice to it and not reduce people to subjects, um, stories to sheer epistemic violence, but, um, but I, I tried. I hope this answers your questions, Irina. And I, I would, I cannot let you go without asking you about the Gezi part. Um, and especially because that's a part of the book that most um, explicitly, I think, links to the political economic uh, logic of the market, et cetera. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so in, um, um, and I'm, I'm very glad to hear that that's like, that stays with you, stayed with you as the Giza Park chapter. Um, it's, um, cause it, it does something like, it uses Giza Park to do like, um, to say something about, um, I don't know, like the, the limits of the left politics today, according to me. This, was, this book was also an opportunity for me to get so much off my chest. I feel like things that I've carried around for 10 years, I'm like, I'm going to put it all in you. Um, so in the Gizzi Park um, chapter, which I think that is also maybe my most like utopian chapter, um, I talk about what it has meant um, to, for a large majority of um, citizens and kind of subjects living in Turkey to find themselves at the other end of moralizing mechanisms of a government. So this is a place where I depart a little bit from scholarship on neoliberalism in the US mostly um, that has emphasized that there's a concentration of um, marginality on the lower echelons of society. And I um, talk about how the AKP government engages in a deployment of marginality. So more and more previously respectable people, previously kind of people who thought of themselves as like, you know, middle class, married, straight, children, everything, um, are finding themselves increasingly on the other end of the moralizing mechanisms of a very polarizing government. And I suggest that that had actually very unexpected but promising outcomes because it was important for people to experience marginalization and that helped people link the um, kind of very economic um, policies and neoliberal urban privatization and redevelopment of projects of the government with its moral projects to kind of morally redesign the public. And um, I talk about how in the protests, as people are protesting the demolition of the park, which was the first point, the protests very quickly take a turn pushing back against like the government's three child. Um, it's not a policy, but push um, the government's kind of ban or like limitation of alcohol sales, but also really demonization of the use of alcohol or tobacco or like, you know, women laughing out in public or co-ed housing or like so many, um, there have, like Turkey has acquired so many moral others and so many quote unquote terrorists in the last like, like less than 10 years, but about 10 years that um, I talk about like, and people finding themselves in public together, like bodies coming together and commoning um, has really shaped the way in which people understand each other. So there are really like exceptional images and like stories from Gizzi where like ultranationalists are resisting the police next to Kurdish activists and like super like people who are considered to be like super straight on macho like soccer fans are working with trans sex workers and those 
it physically coming together moments were deeply important for people to uh, kind of understand what it means to be on the other side of moralizing mechanisms of the government with people who have been on the other side of those for a very long time and to imagine different ways of being together. Um, yeah, and on, on that, um, Marsha Inhorn would like to, to hear a little bit more about recent updates to the story. Um, under AKP and a, a heteronormative pronatalist Erdogan, has there been increasing suppression of public queer activism and what is going on in 2020? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, COVID, um, so not much. <laughs> Sorry, this is not a real answer, but it is part of the answer. So. Um, I have, um, in 2016, after the coup attempt, there was a, and I write a little bit about that too in the book, that I also updated it infinitely, so it was very good that it had to be like just taken out of my hands, um, ultimately. But with the um, coup attempt, the government really upped its discourse of security. And I do track how neoliberalism turns into sort of securitization in the, in the context of Turkey, but I think that is happening in many places in the world. And that has meant that like a wholesale use of public security to just ban events or like, and, and the very vague explanation. So all LGBT related events were banned in Ankara, for instance. Um, towards the end of, I think in the fall, winter of 2016, and we did a round table for Jadalia, me and three other um, scholars and activists about what these bans mean. Um, I think what is happening, and then, and then the, you know, public security and general national security has been used um, increasingly to, you know, sack people, jail people, arrest people with no um, real cases brought against them. Like there are people like, who have been sitting in jail for over three years with no proper. Um, Demir Tash is one. Um, Serhatin Demir Tash, who was one of the co-chairs of um, the Kurdish party HDP, um, but also Osman Kavala, who's like an arts patron. Who there are literally no proper charges being brought against these people. It's been like three years, four years. So, so I think that there is also um, so there is there already has been an impossibility to gather. And I think this is one of the key things that happens under neoliberalism. There's, an in, there's a deep, um, what um, Banu Bargu calls in her book, um, Starve and Immolate, um, cellular, cellularization of life. And that come up, that's taken from the um, political prisoners in the 90s, in the 90s in Turkey, this is pre-AKP, who were resisting the um, F1 style sort of like singular cells for prisoners that would uh, prohibit them from getting together, thinking together, learning from each other while they're imprisoned because they're completely within their, like these like single people cells. And I think that neoliberalism is a deployment of that. It makes collectivities like impossible to perform, impossible to imagine. Um, it, does break down groups. Like it was very interesting to see um, during so that March, the Pride March has been banned since 2015 and it has not taken place. Um, the Trans Pride March happened in 2015 and I was there with my friends and a week later, the larger LGBTI plus March was attacked by the police and no, no Pride March has happened since then. Various events such as film screenings, panels, discussions also have been canceled on and off. Um, but publicly gathering, public gatherings, also like the feminist march that happens on March 1st has been recently attacked. So they just don't want people to gather. And I think that is for a reason. COVID, of course, is a dream come true for an authoritarian government because they get to dictate these like by default. And it is good for public um, you know, health and safety. And I'm not debating that. But I think this is a moment to be extremely mindful of what it means not to be able to gather in public together politically or otherwise. Um, I hope this answers your question, Marsha, but I mean, I think COVID is now an extension of um, prohibitions that now kind of, you know, 
like th there's nothing that people can do there are of course internet gatherings people try to do programming online but um we will see what happens once um once COVID is under control um how much of these regulations will stay with us um i mean already the government um they opened restaurants for instance but they said that all bars and all establishments serving alcohol only will remain closed like and it's unclear how they're how long they're going to remain closed whether they're going to survive being closed for like over a year um so this is a bit of a sideway answer but i hope it's it's something um uh, yeah and and travis that i would like to would like to hear a little bit more about cruel which i think you know uh, this continues part of that uh, part of that answer, but about the diverse ways that cruelty operates in your reading of liberalism. He's also curious if or how Berlin's work on optimism and cruelty might intersect with the neoliberal languages of hope and moral reform that you discuss. This is such a great question. Thank you, Travis. Um, so I do use um, Lauren Berlin's work um on slow death um a little bit in the ahmed Tilda's chapter to think about the wearing down and um kind of slowly annihilating of the kurdish population of the turkish state and how um her work that kind of emphasized that every day i think violence this is really really helpful because i contrast that with ahmed Yildiz's eventful killing um and and try to think about you know why does that become eventful? Why does that become newsworthy? And how do we understand violence through eventworthiness and newsworthiness? Um, so that's how I do use um, her work. I do find her uh, cruel optimism as a really, really interesting uh, framework. I don't use it in the chapter on cruelty because, um, and now I'm really just thinking out loud. I hadn't thought about this before. Because I think she's interested in, um, in the ways in which people are attached to things that are ultimately to their detriment, uh, right? Our attachments, like our inabilities to let go of those things um, that are ultimately not good for our flourishing. And um, cruelty in, um, in the way in which it was brought up by headscarf activists in this case was not thought through attachments necessarily, but it was imagined as like the, the closest thing I can think to it is like, it's, it's a way to recognize the violence of norms um, without using the language of violence or norm. Um, they didn't literally use the words um, when they discussed it, but um, it is, so, so I don't directly connect it to Berlin, but it's something really interesting to think about what, um, what thinking about their framework through kind of affect and attachment would do to the analysis. Um, the way I use cruelty is, and I don't like, I try um, to leave the meaning a little loose. Like I don't give a definition um, of cruelty and, um, and I mean, there's like the easy queer studies uh, answer to that because, you know, definitions are um, normative and restricting, but that's not my reason. It's, it's really the way it was brought up um, was interestingly as this like kind of like self-understood thing, like that would be um, zulum is, is the word that's used in Turkish. Um, and, and that said about like, um, for instance, headscarf activists also use it. I think this is an interesting example. Um, there is an, um, I also use a lot of kind of media data and interviews um, with headscarf activists. And then they do talk about, for instance, in an early, um, there are three headscarf activists that I talk about as a group initially um, who start this petition that is about sort of like, it's called freedom for everyone. And they are saying that we want the right to wear the headscarf, but we want all these um, injustices in Turkey to end indefinitely. We don't just want something for ourselves. We want justice for everyone. And in an interview they give, they say, you know, like, we don't think about 
women with headscarf, like in Turkish, you would say like turbanlı or başörtülü. So it's really one word. You can make a lot of things into one word in Turkish. Um, they say, we don't want this. We don't think of this as an identity, but we're put in a position to sometimes have to state that. Like for instance, we, the three of us met at Hranting's funeral, who is the Armenian Turkish journalist who was murdered um, in, um, I'm trying to remember the exact year. So like, so they, there was a 10,000 people march after his um, murder and that's how they met. So they say, we don't say we as women with headscarf, headscarves walked at Hranting's funeral, funeral. That would be a cruel thing. So they're saying that basically introducing um, our participation or emphasizing our sort of difference in participating in a particular politics is cruel because everybody should care about this. Everybody should walk. We shouldn't make this about us. Obviously, we were going to walk there and say we're all Armenians, we're all Hurans. Like these were the kind of slogans that were used. So the understanding of cruelty is not just like physical violence. It's not just forcing someone to do something, but it's a particular understanding of justice that um, th there's also, I, t I talk about the translation of hak um, to Turkish a little bit because rights have both religious and non-religious meanings. Like you can use it, hak, the word hak it's one of the 99 names of Allah. It means justice, and it's like that, it's this very capacious sense of justice, but it also is used as liberal juridical rights in the books. So I try to talk about how meanings get really muddy. Um, and then and I try to leave um, cruelty as a little bit open to um, be, being kind of pulled. It can't probably talk about everything, but it is it's definitely beyond, it, it involves the juridical, but it goes way beyond it in its understanding of injustice, if that makes sense. But, but Evren, if I could jump in a little bit, to what extent then is uh, cruelty itself a, a, a liberal discourse, especially, I know that ethnographically it came up in a different way, but analytically as, um, as a discourse that um, makes room for things like mu multicultural civility, right? Mm -hmm. That I don't have in your lifestyle, but I can, I, I have to be civil. And um, and to what extent is is it a, a, an alternative framework um, to that, or uh, or is it an, a a different a translation of multiculturalism that is uh, mm -hmm. that is that is uh, what we're seeing unfolding in front of us, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I tend to think that almost anything is co-optable into liberal categories. It's, you can, I mean, um, currently, the term zulum doesn't come up in law at all, and in juridical understanding of violence or rights. So it is, um, it sounds particularly, um, it doesn't particularly sound Islamic, but it sounds very affective and kind of um, like maybe gestures towards a human sensibility. So in that sense, maybe there's a universalizing something there. But, um, but I also want to say that I don't think that politics of cruelty is our solution to liberalism's limits at all. In fact, I, yeah, I think it's something to think with. And I think it's valuable to hear calls to stand up against cruelty as sometimes what people might be able to provide when they cannot provide support for rights. Like, so to me, um, what's important there is to think about what political solidarities strategically might arise in that moment when various groups are saying, we too have suffered police violence or state violence, let's do something about that together but we might di diverge in other ways. I, I do also, yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I'm maybe a, a romantic in the sense of what I expect people are capable of politically and imaginatively, but I have settled for thinking that, you know, um, things are very complicated and maybe 
coalitions and some solidarities will happen momentarily around issues and then people will fall away because they will have divergences in other ways. So, um, but, but you're right. I mean, I think absolutely cruelty can then take up tones of like, um, you know, being a good humanitarian citizen or something like that. But it is, um, it hasn't done that yet. It hasn't taken that turn just quite yet in Turkey. But again, I am trying very careful to thread the, difference between, which is also an analytic difference we made up, right, between liberal and illiberal. And I tried to show that, sure, these are analytic categories that are like useful to think with, but in the messiness of the social, you can't really very easily separate the liberal from the illiberal. And it's a fantasy that we can actually separate them. All right. Well, let's take one final uh, question from the audience. Uh, Joel abdel is has a question about translation and sexuality, oh, uh, sexuality and uh, sexual orientation. I have to read it uh, because it's a technical question. Yeah. In the Arabic context, there are big debates about what terminology to use, such as whether to transliterate the English queer and gay, or to reclaim pejoratives like shad or shada, or, or use newer terms like mitli or mitliya. And these debates often relate to the Masadian critique that you have mentioned. So, Joel is wondering if there are similar debates in Turkey and what you think about the potential political impact of translation, such as feeding into a view of LGBTQ plus identification as non-Turkish. Yes. Um, thank you, Joel, that's a great question. So. I should first say, I also read the question because like, just so I could remember it a little better. Um, first of all, interestingly, Turkish government has so far not engaged in a discourse of LGBTQI plus is non-Turkish. They also haven't done that with feminism. They are not, they're very anti-feminist and they're very anti-queer, roughly. Like, I mean, anti is also a simplistic framework, but, um, but they, are not saying these are not authentically Turkish things. So that discourse is not, like the discourse of authenticity is not being used by the government. Therefore, people on the ground don't feel like they need, they're not held by it and they don't need to respond to it. So, the, but similarly, of course, there is a lot of, um, I don't write about actual translation in the book, but I do have a lengthy footnote in the introduction that traces what queer studies scholarship has been translated to Turkish, just so that the readers have a sense of what people are reading and how much is actually made available um, to Turkish audiences. So, so the, but the uses of more local terms, quote unquote, um, such as um, lubunya or gıcı or uh, like things like that, they exist side by side with the uses of gay and lesbian and trans. Um, and they are, I would say, among the people I have hung out with and I have um, done ethnography and interviews with, they're used kind of seamlessly altogether. So there is no sense of like one is like traditional, authentic, like it, I think they're actually Gaja and Lubunya I find to be quite modern terms as well. And usually that ends up being like a tricky thing where like something that is within the language already. And these are um, not Turkish Turkish terms, they're um, queer slang that is borrowed from Roma languages. Like it's, it's a regular like citizen might not know what these means. Um, there is a claiming of Ibn, uh, which is a derogatory term in um, slogans and banners by activists, but I don't think that goes beyond activist circles. Um, but um, to kind of quickly wrap up for this question, the use of different subjectivity, terminologies around subjectivities like gay, lesbian, but also Lubunya, Gaja, um, et cetera, is done all together. And nobody thinks of some as modern, others as traditional, or some as foreign, others as local. Even though, of course, people know that the term Lubunya, nobody will know outside of the boundaries of Turkey but it's still a modern concept. 
Thank you. Thank you everyone for the questions. Evren, would you like to take this moment to tell us a little bit about your second book project? You sure. talked a, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, actually, thank you so much for asking. And then if anyone from our audience has any thoughts or suggestions, I am at the very beginning of it. I am infinitely open to anything and everything. Um, so this um, comes from, um, actually kind of from the first book. Like I, uh, my dissertation was called um, Queer in Translation, but the subtitle was um, paradoxes of Westernization on sexual others in the Turkish nation. And as I was doing the research, I quickly, I mean, it's sad that it took the research but to do, but um, I quickly noticed that queers were not the only sexual others of the Turkish nation. In fact, historically, they had um, uh, homosexuality and transness or cross-dressing have not been cr criminalized. Um, in Turkey, there's there's a very short period after the 1980 coup that I talk about that's about like a stage ban, um, and that doesn't mean the government or the various governments or the state has been friendly to queer people, but there is no official criminalization of transness or queerness or homosexuality in the Republic. However, there have been very heavy regulation or and legislation of polygamy. Uh, Islamic matrimony and cousin marriages as backward, um, backward practices that the Republic needed to get rid of in order to be a civilized nation state. Um, so I am curious both about the history of that um, heteronormalization in a way of the Republic and the introduction of the kind of monogamous heterosexual couple form as the civilized proper way of relating and that was done through you know various ways like a lot of homosocial spaces were eroded over time like the republican balls where men and danced one-on-one -on -one together western style dances um, are introduced um, through a very particular understanding of women's participation in public space obviously this has happened in many other contexts but also the like you know um removal like increasing kind of like moving off the baths from public baths to indoor baths like there have been a lot of like ways in which multiple adult bodies have like um in like have been removed and made into like the like heteronormative kind of nuclear family so i'm curious about the history but i also will be doing or at least i'm hoping to do post-covid ethnography with people who are still engaging in these practices and to because uh, I'm not going to assume I know what polygamy indicates or how it's experienced and how it's, um, how it's lived. And I've done very, very preliminary um, work for like a week or so. I um, last, not this past summer, but the summer before. And it's already really interesting to hear about how people um, who have polygamous marriages or had polygamous parents think about this practice in like like, you know, probably not surprisingly, deeply modern ways, modern, quote, unquote. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And um, as we close down the colloquium, I want to remind you that our, our next session is on October 29th, and it will be um, Jonathan Worsen's Reimagining the Middle East in the Long Great War. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, for hosting. Thank you for everyone for coming.